Yeah, wisdom. Well, hey, welcome to First Baptist. We're so glad you're here today. If you're visiting with us for the first time, just welcome, welcome, welcome. We had a ton of visitors at our drive-in service, second largest drive-in service we've had in the four months we've been doing it. So let's give a hand to our drive-in people. Uh, of course, it helped, John, that it was 75 degrees today so <laughs> instead of 95. So that's probably why more went drive-in than there are in here today. But drive-in's just been a great blessing. Uh, we thought we'd do it three or four weeks. Uh, three or four months later, here we are still doing it, and it's been a home run for us. God has just been blessing. But then a couple months ago, we added this service uh, for you that uh, felt like you were ready to come back into the house and do the whole social distance thing, and we're glad that you're doing that as well. Our online community, we welcome you. We missed you at 930. The whole Comcast system went down at our church, and therefore, 11 o'clock, no, we know we have some of our 930 folks that missed it at at that slot, and now are on with us at 11. So welcome, online community. I know I miss some of our New York people and West Virginia people. Hopefully you're on right now watching with us. Hey, I want to talk to you today about how to be delivered from dumb decisions. You ever made a dumb decision? In fact, probably even more critical is when we move into indecisiveness, when we just can't make a decision. And that causes all kinds of problems as well, as the famous theologian, Dr. Seuss, reminds us of. Let me read this for you. You can tell uh, my, my mental capacities as a, uh, as since I became a grandfather are going down. Dr. Seuss is now the number one book that I read because of five grandkids. But uh, this is called The Guy Who Couldn't Make Up His Mind. Dr. Seuss writes this. Did I ever tell you about the young Zod who came to two sides in the fork of the road? He looked one way and the other way too, so the young Zod had to make up his mind what to do. Well, the Zod scratched his head and his chin and his pants, and he said to himself, I'll be taking a chance. If I go to place one, that place may be hot. How will I know if I like it or not? On the other hand, too, I feel like a fool if I go to place two and find it's too cool. In that case, I might catch a chill and turn blue. So place one might be best and not place two. On the other hand, though, if place one is too high, I might get a terrible earache and die. On the other hand, though, if place two is too low, I might get some terrible pain in my toe. So place one may be best, and he started to go, and he stopped, and he said, on the other hand, though, on the other hand, other hand, other hand, though, and for 36 and a half hours, that Zod made starts and stops at the fork in the road, saying, no. Don't take a chance. You may not be right. And then he got an idea that was wonderfully bright. Play safe. I'm no dunce. I'll simply start off at both places at once. And that's how the Zod, who would not take a chance, got no place at all with a split in his pants. Well, Dr. Seuss talks about indecisiveness, and I want to talk to you about that same subject today. James chapter 1, I know you're going, oh, wait a minute, Pastor Ron, you left us in chapter 5 last week. I did, but I'm going back, just like a Netflix video, sometimes you got to go back and look because you forgot how you started the whole series. I'm doing that right now in a series called The Rain, and I forget all the dynamics, so I'm going to have to go back and watch the first one, uh, to, you know, to remember all the characters as it begins, uh, I don't know, season three or four. And so today we're going to, in James, our series, Imperfect Living, uh, a perfect living in an imperfect world, uh, we're going to go back to chapter one. So if you look with me in verse five, listen to these verses. Here's what the Bible says. If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask of God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. But when you ask, you must believe and not doubt, because the one who doubts is like the wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Such a person, now watch this, is double-minded and unstable in all they do. The word double-minded in this last verse we read really means two-souled. It means to be pulled apart from two. How many of you have ever had to make a decision, and, and for a few minutes you feel like this is the way to go, and then... You pray about it some more and you feel like this is the way to go. And pretty soon you're like that Zod in the middle of the road, straddling the road, not going anywhere. And indecision keeps you from doing the thing that God has called you to do. I know we all go through that in relationships, in finances, even in the church sometimes. When we were trying to figure out, well, when do we open? 
We wrestled with this in staff meetings. Do we open this week? Do we wait another week? What are other churches doing? What is God trying to say to us? And we opened up a little earlier than some churches, and I caught it from those on the left, and then we didn't open up fast enough for some churches, and I caught it from the right, and so I just strode the road. I said, we're going to open with drive-in. Good compromise. And then, of course, we added this service as well. But somebody had to make a decision so that we could go forward in the things of God. That's what James is trying to say. He's saying three things about decisions and when we refuse to make them. It causes instability in our lives. In fact, verse eight, where it says they are unstable in all they do. This is the picture of a man or woman who is drunk and is staggering all around, can't find their way, don't know where they are. They're completely lost and they're just bumping into things. This is the person that doesn't make a decision. So what do we do in trying to make decisions? Well, first of all, we gotta make a decision because if we don't, we become unstable in three areas of our life. Look on your outline you received as you came in this morning. First of all, when we don't make a decision, we have unstable emotions. We stew inside. We struggle on the inside. We, we strike out at others, all because we are in this tipsy-turvy trying to decide what we do, uh, trying to decide what to do, what we do it with, and when we do it, and that creates all kinds of conflicting emotions in our lives. So when I don't make a decision, my emotions are in a turmoil. Secondly, my relationships become unstable. Uh, do I move to this new job or do I don't? Uh, do, I, do I take this promotion or do I avoid it? Do I change churches or stay in this one? I, I was praying with somebody this week that is considering changing churches. And they said, we want to come to your church. And I said, well, then go tell your pastor. We don't want to do that. We don't want him to know we left. <laughs> and uh, after 41 years of ministry and losing a few people along the way, probably a few hundred, probably, I don't know how many, but, but you know, I always appreciate the people that just came and said, you know, Pastor, you know, we're just feeling led to a different place in a different way and a different lifestyle in our life, and we love you, and we're just, and I was glad. But the people that sneak out the back door, <laughs> you know, those kind of people are on my hit list. We're going to have a talk when we get to purgatory and, uh, you know, and, and, you know, whatever. You get the idea, right? So it produces unstable relationships. Thirdly, it produces an unstable spiritual life. We see that again in verse 7. Look at that with me. The Bible says that uh, when that person that is unwavering, that will not make a decision, that person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. So my, my inability or choice not to go after God's wisdom is going to create instability in my spiritual life. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible that talks about uh, this whole idea of pride blocking the wisdom of God. Proverbs chapter 11 verse 2 says, when pride comes, then comes disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So when I put myself in a place of humility, when I go to the Lord, James chapter 1 verse 5, and I ask him, when I admit I have a need, when I ask him and I anticipate that he's going to answer, then God gives me an answer. But when my pride blocks me, you say, what is pride? Well, pride isn't your nose stuck up in the air. Pride is not necessarily looking down on other people. Pride is when I say, I got this, God. <laughs> you ever done that? I mean, you don't pray about it. You don't really go to heaven about it. You don't consult the Lord. You just say, hey, God, I got this. <laughs> I can handle this. And how many of you discovered that when you don't trust God, when you don't put your faith in God, when you don't get God's wisdom, it usually it can start out well. <laughs> But pretty soon, my, my, my daughters, when they were teenagers, uh, they, at times, uh, I taught them how to pray for a future spouse, and, and they didn't always listen to me. And so they brought home some boys that, let's just say, did not make the pop, pappy cut. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Okay, the, all, you, if you got daughters, they're young, you're going to do the same thing, Okay. There's no guy good enough for, in fact, I had my, my daughter's new boyfriend in the car with me the other day, and, and uh, I took him for a ride. <laughs> a long ride. He said, where are we going? It doesn't matter. <laughs> when are we going to get there when I'm done? <laughs> now, I kind of like the guy. He is a nice guy, and he's a father of Christ and all that. But, you know, I wanted to check him out because she's made some dumb decisions along the way. And, and, and when we do that, when we don't consult with God, we know it looks good at first, but pretty soon chaos erupts. We've all been there, haven't we? Come on, I'm not the only one that's unspiritual, right? You've all made bad decisions in some area of your life because you didn't consult the things of God. So how then do we live in the wisdom of the Lord? Look in chapter 3 of James and verse 13 because he gives us some wisdom here, what you just saw on the video a moment ago. James asked this question, James chapter 3, verse 13. 
Who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. We see humility again there. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom, and it has that in italics to say it's really false wisdom, does not come down from heaven, but is earthly and unspiritual and demonic. Next verse, verse 16. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. So how do you know if you're walking in the things of God? How do you know if you're walking in the wisdom of God? Well, do you have envy? Do you have selfish ambition? Uh, <laughs> just keep looking at the list here. Uh, is there unspiritual things taking place? Is there, is there bitterness going on? Is there confusion and disorder going on? When I'm living outside the will of God, there will be disorder. How do I know I'm living in the wisdom of God? Well, the next verse tells us, verse 17. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure and peace-loving and considerate and submissive and full of mercy and good fruit and impartial and sincere. So a great contrast between the wisdom of this world that comes from my own lack of asking God and produces disorder and selfish ambition and envy versus the wisdom of God that produces what? Order fruitfulness, sincerity, mercy, consideration. That's how you tell if you're, what what is the fruit coming out of the root? You look at the fruit to determine whose wisdom you're walking in. And by your actions and your choices will show whether you're walking in your own wisdom or God's wisdom. So how do we walk in the wisdom of God? Here's the first thing, write these down on your outline. First of all, I admit I need it. (laughs) You say, well, that sounds pretty simple. Well, a lot of times we don't admit we need it. And James chapter one, verse five says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. You say, well, what is wisdom? Well, we get our word philosophy from this word, Sophia. And really philosophy means, how many of you actually studied philosophy in high school or college? Any of you? I had to do it. Dr. Olive was my uh, guy. Yeah, some of you did. And I just remember him coming in, walking into the room, walking out and saying, this room doesn't exist once I walk out. That was his introduction to philosophy. I said, I I was kind of a freshman. I didn't know any better. So I just got the whole class together and we left. (laughs) If the room doesn't exist, he's not here. Why stay? (laughs) Let's just say I barely passed philosophy. (laughs) Dr. Olive and I didn't see eye to eye. But philosophy is the love of wisdom. And the Bible is saying to us, if we admit that we need God's wisdom, that is the start of wisdom. Let me give you another verse. Proverbs says, the admission of the lack of wisdom is the beginning of wisdom. So we've got to admit, I need God's wisdom. Here's the second thing. I've got to ask for it. Uh, One of my little grandkids, I think it's a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, was trying to put a toy together that we got her for uh, Christmas. And she's sort of one of those, y'all got kids like this, right, that just want to do it themselves, don't want your help. They know better than you at three years of age, right? Incidentally, they know better than you at 13, 23. But at 33, when they start having kids, you're now the expert. (laughs) That's how all this works, okay? When they have their first kid, they realize how smart we really are. So, well, she was trying to put this toy together and wouldn't ask anybody for help and and no directions. and, And finally, she just picked it up and threw it to the ground and said, this is impossible, Nothing I do, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I mean, I always had a YouTube thing. I could have put it on YouTube video. Nothing I'm doing works. I've done everything I know, and nothing is working. <laughs> At three years of age. I said, honey, you haven't done everything you know. She said, what do I need to do? I said, you haven't asked me. How many times does God watch you running around in your own wisdom? Here and there with all kinds of chaos all kinds of unnecessary emotional stuff, and God's sitting up there just waiting on you. (laughs) Just waiting on you to say, okay, time's up. I'll ask you, Lord. You gotta admit your need. You gotta ask. And then here's the third thing about this whole idea of wisdom. You've got to anticipate. Verse six says, listen to this, but let him ask in faith, this is James chapter one, verse six, let him ask in faith without any doubting for the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. So if you want wisdom that comes from heaven, you've gotta ask the right person, that is God. You've gotta ask in the right way and that is by faith. You say, well, how do I ask God in faith? Faith is this, listen to this in Hebrews chapter 11, verse six. It says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. 
Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So what is God saying? He says, if you want wisdom, admit you have a need for it, ask me, that is God, and then anticipate I will give you the wisdom that you're asking for for the situation that you're involved in right now. Because end of verse six says, and it will be given to him. I have to by faith believe that God means what he says when he says he'll give me the wisdom that I need. So I admit I have a need, I ask God, and then thirdly, I anticipate that God will give me the wisdom. Now, here's what we do. If God doesn't answer us quick enough, (laughs) we try to help God out. Don't we? I just did a wedding, uh, about, I guess it's been about a month or so ago now, of two people in their 60s, and it was the first time that he had ever gotten married, and the second time for her, her husband had died, and, and so I, I told him, I said, um, I, said uh, what? I, I just got to know, what, what took you so long? <laughs> I, mean, I think he was like 65, something like that. What, what took you so long? And of course, she's standing there, and in the greatest of wisdom, he says, I was just waiting for the right woman. I said, you're going to have a long and healthy marriage. I can tell you that right now. But, but, but can you imagine waiting 60-some years to find the right person that God has for you? Most of us wouldn't. In fact, most people I know that are in their late teens to maybe mid-30s, you know, kind of mess up the first few relationships because they don't wait on God. And I don't know about you, but wait is a four-letter Baptist word for me. <laughs> I don't like waiting. I want to help God out. I want to hurry him along. I don't want to wait on what God's answer is. So I get into trouble when I don't, in my pride, I get into trouble by not waiting on the Lord to give me the answer in his timing. Okay? And this guy in his 60s may live to be 100 and have 30 or 40 years of marriage. A beautiful marriage because he waited upon the Lord. So how do we put that all together and work that out in our life? Let me me give you this last thing because uh, you just need to know how how to apply God's wisdom into your life on a daily basis. Because wisdom is the practical application of knowledge. Culture loves knowledge. God loves wisdom. How do I apply this knowledge in my life? Look at your outline. Here's the first thing I want to give you how to make sure you stay in God's will. Number one, make sure you're a child of God. If you're not one yet, become one. Because the Bible says when Jesus was asked, what, will we, what must we do, John 6, 29, to be doing the works of God? Jesus answered, this is the will of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. So the first thing, whether you watch this online or in here today, to be able to walk in God's wisdom is to become his child. Now, I can't go up to your children or your grandchildren and discipline them, can I? Okay? I can't go up to your kids or grandkids and give them wisdom. I can't go up to them and rebuke them. I can't go up to them and even give them good insight. Only you have been entrusted by God to give your children or grandchildren the wisdom that they need. By right, you can do that because they are part of your family. So if I'm in Walmart and I see some kid misbehaving and I go over and correct him, that parent is going to jump on me pretty quick, right? Even though that kid may need it because that kid doesn't belong to my family. God is the same way. You've got to understand, God's the same way. God speaks to his children, And when you're in the family of God, God will speak to you. He will give you the wisdom. He says, verse 6, it will be given unto them. God gives you the wisdom you need because you're, what father doesn't answer his children when he comes? I mean, on those rare moments that my kids, they don't ask as much as they used to. But on those rare moments when they come and they say, Dad, what do you think about? Man, I, I don't act like it, but my heart starts beating fast and I get this warm, fuzzy feeling inside because I feel useful again. I mean, they used to come a lot more. Now they're adults, you know, and got it kind of together themselves. They're smarter than me on a lot of things. But when they come and ask for wisdom, I rejoice in that. I don't say to them, hey, go to your room, two to three weeks, bread and water for you. I freely and generously give them my wisdom. Listen, God does the same thing for you. As his child, he gives you the wisdom you need for every situation of life. So first of all, be his child. Number two, write this down. The second prerequisite is to obey at least in what you know, the will of God in the areas where you know his will. That's a mouthful, but let me kind of succinctly put it together. Obey what you know. You see, you can't do more until you start obeying God's word that you already know. So people come to me and they say, I I wanna start growing spiritually. I feel like I'm a little stagnant. My first question is always, are you obeying what you already know? (laughs) 
Well, well, no. Well, you think God's going to give you something more to obey if you're not already obeying that which you already know? I mean, God, I mean, God gives you wisdom as you obey in the areas where you already know his will. And when you're obeying, God generously gives out his wisdom to those that are obeying and walking in his ways. So I'm his child, first of all. I obey what I know. Here's the third thing, guys. Consult the scriptures to discern what God wants. So here's what the scriptures do. The scriptures give you the general guidelines. So when my girls used to come to me and say, Dad, uh, how do we know who to marry? Well, I wish I could pick out here, you know, uh, Jim, you know, Jumbo, Bubba, you know, whatever, you know, and find a name in here for them to marry. That'd be a lot easier, right? But instead, God gives the general guidelines on how to act as a single person. You can read about it in Ephesians chapter uh, 5 and, and 1 Thessalonians uh, chapter 3 and several other passages where it talks about uh, 1 Corinthians uh, uh, chapter 13 and, 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 or 12 and 13 where God talks about how to live as a single person. Then you may say, well, I'm already married. What do I do? The Bible gives you the guidelines. The Bible doesn't tell you specifically what to do with your wife or husband, but it does give you general guidelines. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church, Right? A wise support and respect your husband so he'll be able to serve with joy and, 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 and peace. I mean, the Bible gives us guidelines. The specifics come from the Holy Spirit who lives inside of me. Are you getting this? So the Holy Spirit will say, if you're listening, if you're walking in him, he'll say to you, that one. <laughs> I think I've shared this story, but when I first saw Pat, I just felt like the Holy Spirit sent me. First day of Carson Newman College, I looked over, there she is walking in the cafeteria, and the Holy Spirit did something to me. He said, that one. <laughs> I actually kind of wanted the girl in front of her, and the Holy Spirit said, not that one. <laughs> you say, did that really happen? That's a true story. I mean, because <laughs> come to find out later, the one in front of her was um, her roommate who was already engaged to somebody, so I wouldn't have had a chance anyway. God knew who, see, God didn't give me Pat's name in his scripture. He gave me guidelines on how to search for the right person. Are you getting this? Guidelines. The Holy Spirit in me gave me the specifics. That's how wisdom operates in the word of God. So parents, just find all the passages that deal with how to live as a single. And teach your kids how to live as a single. Because when you get good at being single, you get good later at being married. I see a lot of people who don't like themselves get married to another person that doesn't like themselves, and then they wind up not liking each other after a few years. The Bible will protect you from that by giving you the guidelines and the Holy Spirit giving you specifics. Here's, here's the fourth thing I want you to see, guys. Write this one down in your outline. The fourth point that I want to give you is you must be willing to accept the will of God <laughs> before you know what it is. Come to God saying, yes, Lord, what do you want? What can I do? What's the question? You see, when I come to God and I say, Lord, show me your will, and then I'll figure out whether I really want to do it or not. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. God doesn't give you a plan and say, read all this, and then if you like it, you can choose whether to do it or not. Listen, God has no plan B for your life. The people in the Bible that tried to do a plan B, I'll just give you two examples, Moses and Jonah. Moses spent 40 years in the wilderness wandering around with a bunch of complaining Hebrews. And Jonah spent three days and three nights in the smelly belly of a welly of a fish because they chose plan B for their life rather than plan A. God has no plan B. He has plan A for your life. And when you're walking in him, he will reveal it to you. He will, he will coach you in it. He'll, he'll put barriers up to keep you in the right lane for it. He will, he will guide you in it when you're walking in relationship with him. But you gotta obey it even before you know what it is. Here's step five. Oh, your mama used to teach you this. When in doubt, what? Don't. <laughs> right? Didn't your mama say that? Maybe, okay, you had to have an East Kentucky mama. I don't know. But my mama used to say, when in doubt, don't. <laughs> you say, what does that mean? It just simply comes down to this. It means, it means there, there can be no hint of, of well, well, let me put it this way. Several years ago, when Pat and I were first married, many years ago, decades, um, I, I, we had just started this church. The church was blowing up. I mean, it was growing, growing, growing. And I got this job offer from a state convention, uh, Indiana. And um, 
uh, and had another job offer with the church, which is a very large church. So I was kind of battling, Lord, are you asking me to move? But I used a different story at 930. Let me use the other story because this was all happening about the same time. So this guy named Mark wanted me to come work on his state convention office. Now, I was kind of proud of it because I was like 20, I don't know, 25, 6, 7, something like that. I thought, man, he wants me. Well, that's pretty cool, you know. And, and, yeah. and I think I was the only one that said yes. And um, so uh, a lot of money, a lot of prestige. I'd be editing the paper and heading up the college ministry for the state convention. And so I, I really wanted to do it. But I had a little bit of a doubt. I, I just wondered, you know, there's some things about, I just, I, and that little doubt kept me in the end from taking the position. Within about 18 months, the whole thing crashed and burned, as well as the other church that I was thinking about. Within 18 months, both those things crashed and burned. The, the church that wanted me uh, uh, basically just burned down spiritually to the ground. The state convention, uh, they had to let the guy go, and uh, the whole state convention staff uh, was let go. And I mean, both situations, state convention church, both crashed and burned. And if I would have taken either one of those positions, I would have crashed and burned with them. The doubt that God put in my heart kept me from making a very bad decision. Are, are you getting this? So when in doubt, don't. How do you know when to go forward? Let me give you these last two. Number six on your outline. Agree that no matter what it costs you, God's decision is final. Are you willing to do that? Even if you think that, oh, this could really be good. I had a friend one time that, um, that uh, said, uh, Pastor, I'm thinking about taking this job promotion. It's going to be more money, and uh, it's a great place to live. And so they moved out there. I, I kind of told him, I said, I just, I'm not sure. You know, have you checked this out? Oh, it's going to be great. So he got out there, and it was, it was like 40 miles to his office from his house. So he had to buy a second car, which they had one car uh, when they lived in Martinsburg. Um, they, uh, the cost of living was a lot higher. The taxes were a lot higher. He didn't put that all. And his wife, who was an educator uh, with special needs kids, couldn't find a job. And within about a year, they were in severe debt. Uh, they were miserable, and they were ready to come back home. You see, even when it's a good deal, it doesn't mean it's God's will. Even when it looks like it's something that God is going to use to bless you does not mean it's the right decision that you should make. And so, so what do you do? Here's the seventh thing. You test and confirm your decision with spiritually mature people. So a lot of times what I do, I used to call Pete Winter. I buried him many years ago. I used to call John Wise. Uh, he's in, I think, uh, Tennessee now. Uh, I, I used to call Ed Burwell. Uh, he's still in Martinsburg, 87 years old. These were men that were business people, spiritually mature people I tested decisions with. And I want to tell you something about this. Many times we go to our friends for wisdom who don't always have our best interests at heart or who tell us what we want to hear. Rather than going to spiritually mature people who still love us but tell us what we need to hear. Do you see the difference? And many times, folks, you will save yourselves boatloads of grief if you'll test a decision you're trying to make with two or three people who are spiritually more mature than you, who've been walking with God longer, who are not going to give you just a yes just to please you, but are going to tell you the truth, just bounce the idea off of. doesn't mean you've got to even, what it, what it means is this, folks, when in a multiplicity of counselors, there is victory. Amen. That's why in our church right now, we're, we're going to be looking at a new constitution of bylaws that expands things from a one pastor rules everything to a multiplicity of pastors, multiplicity of leaders. Why? Because in the multiplicity of leadership, there is what? Victory. And I don't know where you're at today, but you're living your life by one of three things. You're living your life by circumstances, you're living your life by conditions, or you're living your life by choices. Circumstances make you unstable because at any, any single day, Life changes. Conditions may be good today and gone tomorrow, but the only thing that matters is when you make the choice to go to God and say, Heavenly Father, what do you think? See, we'll close here. The greatest decision you can make in life, friends, whether you're watching online or here, is the decision about what you're going to do with Jesus Christ. I toyed with him for 18 years, I went to church every Sunday. I did the prayer, even preached a sermon at 16. 
You know, I mean, I was in the groove, even led the youth group for a while, but did not know Jesus. Oh, I knew about Jesus. (laughs) I didn't know Jesus. And I had to make a decision in my life at 18 to invite that Jesus into my life, to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life. And it may be watching today from your home, listening in the car, sitting out here in the sanctuary. Maybe that's something you have toyed with, you've thought about, but you've been like the zode in the middle of the road. (laughs) You've been indecisive about receiving him. Here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask you to close your eyes with me, whether you're watching from home, watching here right now, just just kind of close your, just to kind of shut out the things of life right now. And if you have never asked Jesus Christ, just with your heart before God, your eyes closed, if you have never asked Jesus Christ to come into your life, if you've heard the stories, listened to the sermons, even read the Bible, but you've never made the commitment to follow Jesus, would you pray this prayer right now? Would you pray, Jesus My life, I'm realizing, absolutely needs your wisdom. But to get your wisdom, I know now I need to become your child. And so right now, today, please come into my life. Wash me free of my sin. Inhabit my life. Change my life. I want to be your child. Just with your eyes still closed, Man, God will honor that request. God's greatest joy is saying to his son, hey, somebody just asked you to come into their life. Go. Go enter them now. There may be others of you today who simply say, you know, Ron, I've been living my life recently. I'm already a Christ follower, but I've been living my life on the basis of my wants and my needs, and I've been controlling my life, and I've been making decisions based upon what I want and I've not been walking in the wisdom of God. And today maybe you just need to say to God, to your heavenly Father, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me from not consulting you for your wisdom, from not walking in obedience in your ways. I want to get back on the right path today, Father. I've been living in pride, doing things on the basis of what I want to do. And today, I humble myself before you. Your wisdom is all that matters. Finally, there may be some of you today, either online or on site, who may just say, you know, I need a church home to grow up in. I need to become part of a church family where there can be those spiritual mature people to speak into my life where I can make contributions of my own life into this family. Maybe today you just need to say, you know, today I want to become part of a family. I want to become part of this First Baptist family. And in just a moment, just again, I'm going to pray a prayer in just a second. You can have an opportunity to fill out the connection card attached to your bulletin for whatever decision you're making. Or online, going to our website at bcde.com and just filling out a place where it says connect, and then hit on connection card. Let us know the decision you're making today. We want to rejoice in that with you. Father, I pray right now. God, we've all made some dumb decisions, but we don't have to keep making them. Help us to drop all pride and walk in your wisdom. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you look this way, guys, for just a moment? Um, We're going to show you a video in just a second, but uh, we're also going to take our offering. If you're online, they're showing up a little slide right now to show you how to give electronically, the magic of the mojo of electronic giving. So cool. And uh, also, if you're here today, we don't pass the plate yet. They're still not allowing us to do that. But uh, we do have plates at the back if you'd like to give an offering either by cash or check or online as well, your app. And many of you uh, uh, just need to download our app on your phone, FBCDE. I know some of you have flip phones from 1992, but uh, you know, we'll help you out if you need some help today. Uh, and if you don't know how to download the app, just go to your app store, uh, 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 iPad, I, what is it? I, what's the other one? Android? And- 
Yeah, that. And uh, just go, <laughs> go to that store <laughs> or your iTunes store. I mean, I'm still learning technology. And uh, just down, it's a free app. Just F-E-C-D-E, type it in, it'll download, takes a few seconds to upload, and uh, you can use that for all kinds of information, registration for things, as well as uh, new virtual groups that are starting all the time, as well as giving, if that's where uh, God has you. Let's watch this video, and then we'll close out with prayer. great video. I just want to go mountain climbing now, don't you? <laughs> but we want to bring our mountain down, so let me give you this closing announcement, really, too. Uh, Wednesday night, uh, don't forget, we're on site for Soul Cafe all night worship. Uh, we're going to do about 35 minutes of worship, then a celebration time, s'mores on fire pits with marshmallows at the end, about an hour, 7 to 8 p.m. If you're comfortable enough to come on site, that's this Wednesday night at 7. We're also going to be doing it online except for the s'mores. We haven't figured out a way to get that to you, but maybe we, maybe we can transport it to you somehow. Uh, so that's Wednesday night. De debt Mountain, guys, many of you know that we inherited a debt. Uh, from the previous administration that we've been trying to pay off. Uh, we paid down about a third of it so far. We want to get the rest of this mountain gone in 2020. Wouldn't that be great just to end 2020 and say the mountain of debt is gone? Uh, you can see on the wall as you go out today on the left, there's a, a representation there of what debt is still owed. And, and uh, each time we get a certain amount, we tear off another rock. But this video just reminded us that we felt re really compelled uh, this year, uh, especially during COVID. We prayed about it and felt really moved by God to invite you to do a couple things. One is, uh, I talked to somebody this, uh, today that is making crafts and selling them and going to put the money, you know, towards uh, the debt mountain. Uh, other people have given designated gifts to the debt mountain. Uh, one person said, can they do a car wash? Fine, you go do washes. Many cars, I pray you'll wash a thousand cars. And, uh, you know, whatever God leads you to do. I know a couple people are having yard sales and donating the money. But one of the things that you can do that almost any of us can do is give a dollar a day. And this is a new program we're starting in September called A Dollar a Day, which almost any of us could do that. Putting a dollar aside, giving it monthly, so it'd be about $30 a month. And we figured out if we have two or 300 people doing that, man, we'll just keep, we'll keep taking those rocks off one by one very, very quickly. And this is a way that for those of you that just say, you know, we're cash poor, we're not even working right now, we're living on unemployment. Many of you live on uh, retirement incomes that are very, very strict. Man, I get that. I'm, I'm almost there. But I think any of us could put back a dollar a day and give it monthly. And again, if we had two or 300 people doing that, we would knock this mountain down very, very quickly. So guys, you do what God calls you to do. You pray about it. Participate in it at some level. And let's, let's stand here in January and say the mountain's gone. Wouldn't that be great? That'd be a wonderful thing. Let's stand together. Let me pray for you as we get ready to wrap up. Father, today we thank you so much for just teaching us again about wisdom, Lord, for guiding us, Father, uh, in, in your truth from your scriptures, Lord, for uh, filling us with the need, Lord, to seek you and to keep on asking you about your will in our lives. And so, Father, if anybody is confused today, don't let them leave here today until they have their spiritual questions answered.
God, we love these people in this room, those that were at drive-in, those watching us right now. God, let them know that your love conquers all. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.